Good morning, everybody. I'm Philippa. I'm one of the local paediatricians. I'd like to acknowledge the Wadawurrung people of the Kula Nation as the rightful owners and traditional custodians of the land where we stand. Uh, normally, when I'm presenting early in the morning or running a clinic early in the morning and I'm over-caffeinated because I've had a rough night the night before, normally it's because I've been on call and Sam Sabari's delivered 36 week twins or something and I've had no sleep. But um, not this morning. This morning I'm over caffeinated and slightly under the weather because I took my 10 year old to Harry Potter last night, the theatre up in Melbourne. It was amazing. It was really good. Anyway, so I was asked to cover paediatric emergencies in one hour, acknowledging that. The vast majority of paediatric emergency medicine is done by GPs and acknowledging that emergency training as a general paediatrician is an additional two and a half years on top of your training as a general paediatrician. Um, I've got about seven cases, each of which is two or three slides, aiming to get lots of participation from you, lots of talking about differential diagnosis of fevers, fits, faints in kids. Uh, no videos. My presentation last year was very heavy on videos and the IT is not as great this year, so I thought I wouldn't try to risk that. Um, but please pitch in, just shout out, put your hand up, any questions at any point. Okay. The Victor charts are a statewide approach to trying to determine whether a child's clinical observations are within a normal range for how old they are or whether they are tachypneic, bradycardic, tachycardic, respiratory distress, degrees of oxygen saturation. Um, straw poll, uh, who has an oxygen SATS monitor freely available in their clinic room? Beautiful, three quarters. Who has a glucometer in your clinic room? Yep, three quarters. All right, beautiful. Does anybody have the glucose gel 20% uh, dextrose gel buckle treatment for hypoglycemia. Beautiful, couple of people. Very easy to keep a tube of that in a corner um, to manage hypoglycemia very quickly and rapidly in small children as well as in adults who might be hypoglycemic. Uh, and who feels confident doing a Glasgow coma scale in a kid? <laughs> I've got both of my hands down. Everybody's heard of the AVPU scale, alert, alert to voice, alert to pain, unresponsive. Yeah. Uh, that's about as good as most paediatricians do. But if you can do a good description over the phone about why you're worried about the neurology of a child in front of you, that's a, a huge help. So the Victor charts are very helpful because what is normal uh, observations for children at different ages changes. Uh, and also, if you have lots of clinical exposure to sick kids, apart from getting sick a lot yourself and or getting hand dermatitis <laughs> from using your Avogad. Does everybody do that? I know I'm not going to get flu if I've got dermatitis by April, right? as well as getting my flu vax by April. Uh, and APLS.org.au. APLS, the Advanced Paediatric Life Support Course, is an internationally recognised program. It takes three days and it's quite intensive, but there's a lot of uh, online learning and then a manual that you get to take home and then clinical scenario based workshops and uh, it, it's gung-ho, it's about two and a half thousand dollars, two and a half, three thousand uh, dollars and all of the instructors on APLS are all volunteers so all of that money is ploughed into the IT and the manual and keeping up to date with the uh, ill core guidelines for resuscitation in children that changes. Um, the APLS course is well worth doing if you are worried about sick kids that you're seeing regularly in your clinic and worried about your capacity to assess and manage them very quickly. So I'm going to launch into fevers and then we'll cover fits and funny turns in kids in the second half. And as I mentioned before, um, hi, I'm Philippa, anybody who came a bit late. You're all here because we get to take a break for coffee earlier, right? Because <laughs> we get the 10 o'clock morning tea break instead of the 11 o'clock. Okay. Please pitch in, put your hands up, ask, shout out, any questions that come along the way. So risk factors for overwhelming infection. Newborns have a unique combination of cellular and humoral immunity difficulties. 
uh, and any fever to 38 degrees in a child who's under three months of age needs to go to an emergency department for paediatrician workup. It's very difficult to assess uh, focus of infection in the under three months and they're much more likely to have a bacterial septicemia at the same time as viral symptoms. It's really hard to pick. So um, if you're under three months of age and you've got a fever of 38, do not pass go, do not collect $200. Please go straight to your emergency department. But if you'd like to, call the paediatrician on duty for Heathwing 3 as you're sending them in and give them a heads up as to what you've seen in front of you in clinic. Kids who are six months of age, give or take a month, their immune system is starting to build up on their own, but they are at the nadir of uh, the immunoglobulins that they've received from their mum across the placenta in the third trimester. So occasionally we'll find a child who is uniquely immunodeficient at six months of age in that they, they just won't have the immunoglobulins there. They won't have any memory from, that they inherited from their mum. So that's a relatively common age for um, inborn errors of immune system, so immune deficiencies to be identified, so the severe combined immune deficiency in children. Kids who are doing regular childcare are not so much at risk of overwhelming infection, but they're getting very frequent viral infections. And so when they come in with a bacterial infection, it's, it can be really hard to pick. A lot of parents will keep childcare kids with a serious bacterial infection home later than they would otherwise because the parents are used to dealing with a snotty febrile toddler preschooler all of the time. That's their normal state of being. Also, unfortunately, um, in childcare there are quite a few bacterial infections that get spread rapidly around childcare. Uh, and there are some kids who, again, are relatively immunodeficient uh, in terms of how they can mount a good immune response to those infections. Teens aren't so much uh, risk of overwhelming infection, but if your immune system is otherwise fantastic and then you get severely unwell with a severe infection in your teens, it's more likely to be something really nasty, like a pneumococcal meningitis or a meningococcus. Unimmunised kids, asplenia is incredibly rare, but it does occur sometimes, and then there's the inborn errors of immunity. So how do we try to pick in clinical practice, whether a febrile child may be febrile due to a bacterial infection or viral infection or other. Any tips? How they look. How they look? What do you mean by that? Um, yep. So pale and hot. Pale and not moving and hot. Yep. Yep. Kids who have a viral picture will often be quite playful in between fevers. When they're sort of feeling a bit better, you know, they'll drink a bit, they'll play a bit, and then the fever will resurge, and then they'll go flat and miserable and unwell again. Some kids with a severe bacterial infection will just progressively slide, 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 and they will have no point over those two or three days of fever when they are playful. Anything else anecdotally? Anything else you use in your practice? Pardon? Are they, well? Are they feeding well? Doesn't help you? Bacterial versus viral? Might help you in terms of finding the source of a fever, but not whether it's bacterial or viral. I think if they get grumbling on well on the stool, probably sudden deterioration. Sudden deterioration, yeah. Yep. Could be bacterial, could be viremia. So what does the research tell us in terms of what are the clinical signs that we can rely on to try to determine bacterial versus viral source of a serious infection? The duration of a fever doesn't help you, unless it's five days, six days, seven days, in which case you're not so much worried bacterial or viral, you're worried if it might be Kawasaki disease. The peak number of the fever doesn't actually help you when they've crunched the numbers in big research studies. If you're 38.2 versus 40.2, that doesn't actually help you. I mean, a viral otitis media will cause such rapid swings in temperature that uh, it can look quite dramatic. Rigors, febrile convulsions. Response to antipyretics doesn't help you. So any given dose of ibuprofen or paracetamol will drop your temperature by one to two degrees for one to two hours. That's it. And that doesn't matter whether it's bacterial or viral, that's across the board. 
and unfortunately oral cefaclor for two days, partial response, not much response, doesn't help you at all. Isn't it it's such a pity with cefaclor having the side effect profile that it does because it's otherwise got such a good spectrum of activity against the classic airway illnesses in kids. A really detailed clinical examination will help you. So I decided a while ago that I'm not going to look at bronchiolitis, otitis media. I'm not going to talk about that today. I thought you guys see all that all the time. The one thing that does actually help when they plough all the numbers through all the different research studies is tachycardia. And this is where your Victor charts can come in handy or figuring out what the normal heart rate is for a child at a particular age. Both the maximum heart rate during a peak of fever but also a persistent tachycardia between fever peaks. So when the child has had a surge of fever, they've reached 39 degrees, the heart rate was 180 to 210 during the fever of 39 degrees, and now they are 37.2 again, and they're looking much more comfortable, sweaty, hot, cranky, but afebrile at the moment. If they are still tachycardic at that point, that's much more concerning for a bacterial source rather than viral source. And then the rest of it's clinical pattern recognition. I should mention, given that we're heading into the winter season, the exception to that question of bacterial versus viral determining tachyc um, with a tachycardia as your trigger, as your helper, doesn't help if you've got myocarditis. And that's something that we've been seeing more and more of in the hospitals with small children with viruses. So we've had swings of parechovirus and enterovirus myocarditis in small infants going through the hospital, about every three to five years, there'll be a swing of an enteroviral myocarditis picture. And on average, for the last 15 years in Geelong, each time we've had a surge like that, there's been one death in an infant under two months of age. So a baby usually whose mum has been unwell with gastro or older sibling unwell with gastro, the baby gets gastro, they get tachycardic, hot, red rash, and then they start getting cardiac failure and there's almost nothing you can do. It's incredibly sad, incredibly challenging to manage clinically. But this isn't actually supposed to be an enterovirus year, so just remember that one for three to five years from now. Our enterovirus year was the year before, and then about four years before that. Although we actually, the other aspect of um, enterovirus and paracovirus research that's going to take one of our paediatric registrars through to a PhD, I hope, is that the same years that were parochovirus and enterovirus myocarditis years were also years where we had a big spike in type 1 diabetes diagnoses in kids. So we need to, we need to look into that one. That's Peter Villeman's job. <laughs> OK. Should we cover some cases? We've got about four or five febrile cases and then a couple of fits, funny turns cases. OK. So eight-year-old boy. Asthma, eczema, allergic runners. This boy came to my room on Wednesday last week. Highly anxious, separated parents, the kind of acrimonious separation where neither of the parent can make eye contact with anybody in the room if the other parent is in the room. Both parents just go into AVO mode. The boy came in with five days of rash. The fever had been fluctuating, not particularly high fever and the parents had been instituting normal eczema management, but were finding that it was too painful and tender for him to tolerate ex good eczema management. So they actually came back to their, this, or I should say all of the cases that I'm presenting are cases where kids have seen either the same GP on two or three occasions, or two or three different GPs over the three or four days before they've reached a paediatrician. So fevers and rigors started relatively low dose cephalexin, made no difference and he, start, he had more rigors and higher fevers after staying at Keflex. Poor oral intake, vomiting, tachycardic and pale and about 20 to 30 percent of his thighs have desquamated in the last 24 hours. So they came to my rooms and his legs and genitals were wrapped in cling wrap with quite a lot of moisturiser under the cling wrap and he was walking like this. John Wayne. So this isn't actually him, but this is a Google photo of a rash that looked very similar. Any suggestions? Any thoughts? Eczema herpeticum? Yep. 
So what HSV infections can bring eczema undone? Herpes, herpes is a family, right? Pretty much all of them. <laughs> so HSV1, HSV2, varicella zoster can be horrific in kids who've got background nasty eczema, and also coxsackie. So a paediatrician uh, dermatologist, paediatric dermatologist coined the term eczema coxsackium rather than eczema herpeticum. So we think he probably had a coxsackie type picture to his eczema initially, but then it's become secondarily bacterially infected with, and he, now he's got staph in petigo with widespread skin desquamation. And I was concerned when I saw him that he was starting to look like a Stevens Johnson's. Um, quite tricky. Keflex isn't a classic trigger for Stevens Johnson, but Stevens Johnson's is really rare. So I've, I've only seen one before, and that kid was within was in ICU within 10 hours of presenting to the GP with desquamating rash. Okay. Next case. This girl was a challenge behaviourally. Um, mum convinced she's on the spectrum, has had gateways assessment, and then my assessment, and then a different psychologist speak. Nobody thought this girl was on the spectrum, but mum was convinced she was. Four days of variable fevers, cough, lethargy, no change to her appetite. She seemed to be limping sort of antalgic gait on both sides. It wasn't a neurological gait, and there wasn't any one joint that seemed to be giving her gait difficulties. No difficulty standing up or sitting down. She wasn't wincing when she moved around. She just, mum said, she seems really stiff, but her legs seem weak. And when she looked like she was walking more strongly, so walking in and out of the waiting room, it looked like she was walking more strongly when she was tilted over to the left. How do we start with evaluating this girl clinically? I sort of started at her toes and went everywhere, I think. So it was the luxury of time. I'm examining her head to toe, full system. So every centimetre of skin, ear, nose, throat, heart sounds, pulses, making sure she's well perfused throughout to her peripheries, making sure she's got brisk central capillary return, checking her observations on the Victor charts, and then examining her joints, trying to get her moving. Is she stiff in the back? Does she have a septic hip? Does she have an irritable hip on the background of a viral infection? She had a bilateral pneumonia. And I've heard of this, apparently this is something that it comes to Heath Wing 3 at the Geelong Children's Ward about once every couple of years. Uh, I suspect this girl's obesity was actually part of the challenge here. She's quite challenging to examine clinically. Uh, and she had an odd gait because she was only really comfortable when she was, I'm sure she had a pl pleuritic component to it her pain, but she, her, her limp was really odd. Could you hear that? Could yeah, you hear oh yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So examine her chest and she's got florid creps and you know, tap it out and she's got a fluid level and yeah, yeah. Her oxygen sats were normal. She's too young for um, mycoplasma, which is a bit annoying. We don't tend to see mycoplasma in kids before prep, before prep grade one. Mycoplasma tends to be the sort of seven to 12 year old kid who's otherwise completely fit and well, you know, athletic, plenty of respiratory reserve, and they get hypoxic and tachypneic without actually getting that higher degree of fever. The crackles are sort of diffuse. It's not a classic bacterial low bar pneumonia. It's more of a hazy, atypical picture, and they get really quite, um, quite hypoxic with any given degree of respiratory distress. A three-year-old boy. Um, this boy had seen a GP daily for three days and then mum drove him to the emergency department and he lost consciousness as he arrived. Fully immunised, previously well. He's the middle of three kids, so there's a six-week-old baby at home. Two days of spiking fevers, vomiting, coughing. He seemed to have the same thing as everybody else had at daycare. And he's started by a GP on a reasonable dose of amoxil. And the mum had no idea where this fever was coming from. Mum was an ICU nurse, an adult ICU nurse. And she said she'd seen that 
um, so this boy was um, fully continent in the daytime and very distressed at the thought that mum was going to put a nappy on him. He was really determined, you know, he was out of nappies and he didn't want to go back into nappies even though he was quite sick. And she'd helped him to the bathroom and helped him stand up to urinate. And he seemed to be shaking and bursting into tears, standing up to urinate. And then the next day, he was either unable or unwilling to walk and had a large painful diarrhoea into a nappy in the car on the way into the emergency department. And his rashes were really unusual by the time he arrived. Any suggestions? Has anybody seen kids like this? It's not a great picture. It's a much older child, sorry. But the, the rash was pretty classic. So sandpapery hot erythema. So he had the toxin-mediated sepsis. So he had group A strep with a classic scarlet fever rash. Um, he had a toxin-mediated sepsis and he, um, was a, he was really hard to get from ED to ICU without, um, without dropping his bundle. Uh, so the challenge with this boy in the emergency department was getting not just IV access, um, which ended up being at first an intraosseous in his leg and then that one blue and getting an intraosseous in his other leg. And that was when I knew that um, his mum had a really good understanding of how sick he was because when we got the second intraosseous and it started flowing, she said, thank you. And this was an awake three-year-old getting an intraosseous for the second time in half an hour and she was thanking us for getting that done. Um, he, he was incredibly unwell. Um, so fluid filling and then went into, started to go into respiratory failure. He received 60 mils per kilo of fluid resuscitation crystalloid at that point. Uh, and we were shifting into blood, fresh frozen plasma. He was starting to get coagulopathic with the amount of crystalloid we'd given him. And then trying to get his inotropes right and good enough so that he didn't arrest on induction for intubation and transfer to Melbourne. So this boy had an empyema in his chest that was the likely source of his group A strep infection, um, which didn't actually fit with his clinical picture at all. Um, but the dysuria persisted even as he was recovering. The um, toxin-mediated skin changes persisted even after he was extubated and recovering on the children's ward up at um, Geelong. Uh, he was incredibly sick. Sorry? Yep. Yep. So his dysuria was due to, um, so he had a um, urethritis, um, an inflamed urethra, and a sterile cystitis, I guess. Okay, so um, with inflammation of his bladder and urethra as part of his toxin-mediated infection. And um, the diarrhoea is the gut effect of the toxin-mediated sepsis. Yeah. Oh, it um, didn't touch the sides, yeah. Oh, look, um, so he, he was so rapidly unwell. It must, so the, whatever bug it was that got him, particularly virulent, nasty strain, and he was, uh, his immune system was intact. Um, so I think this was just an overwhelming infection evolving. He was completely well three days before, and it hit him so hard. The amoxyl dose, it certainly didn't hurt, but um, it didn't touch the sides. There was another question. Yep. Yep. Uh, so sequential. So a third strike and you're in is a take that is used pretty universally by emergency departments that see kids. So kids who are presenting to an emergency department three times within the same illness need admission, even if everybody thinks. He's, you know, it's an otitis media. The kid is presenting three times with an otitis media. The parents are, and I think um, that should always take into account GP presentations as well. It shouldn't be just the emergency department. Um, 
So how could this have been picked up early? Spike and fevers, vomiting, coughing in a daycare kid with no runny nose could be anything. It could be anything but repeated presentations. Um, healthcare trained parent is a risk. <laughs> um, so a lot of healthcare trained parents will really avoid taking their kids to healthcare unless they think they really need to. Um, it's a uniquely uh, toxic intersection in my mind when one of my children is sick. That's a really confronting place to go in my mind. Um, and um, never forget taking my firstborn to a GP in um, Bly Street, I think, in Brunswick when I was doing one of my registrar rotations at the Royal Children's Hospital. And um, I, was re I was really worried about him. I just We'd had no sleep for two nights straight and recurrent fevers and I didn't think I could pick a source. And I was studying for my written exams and I wasn't thinking straight. <laughs> and I took him to the GP and GP said, oh, what do you think it is? I'm like, no! <laughs> no, no, no! This one needs to be on your shoulders. I just need to be mum. Um, I mean, kids of healthcare workers are also at risk because healthcare workers bring home all sorts of weird and wonderful things and we're not that great at washing our hands sometimes. But uh, I've forgotten your question, I'm sorry. Was there a point where we could have picked this boy and brought him to healthcare sooner? Uh, I think in kids who have toxin-mediated sepsis as part of their bacterial illness, the bacterial illness looks sort of a little bit grumbling, not quite right, not easy to pick what the source is, and then they're off the cliff. The, the toxin-mediated component of it has a feel to it when you're managing it in the recess room in ED that the boulder is running down the hill and you can't catch it. Um, it has the same feel if you ever see a kid who's on immunosuppressants, whether it's they're a transplant recipient in kids, uh, if they come in with gram-negative infections, so a transplant recipient with a UTI, um, they are going to go to ICU within six hours of presenting to ED with their first fever with that illness, or they're going to die in your recess cubicle. You know? um, so there's the, the toxin-mediated component is rapidly overwhelming all of the body's defences that maintain um, blood supply to the head. So you, your brain cells only need oxygen, glucose and stable electrical chemical gradient across the membrane and um, toxin-mediated sepsis will do, will knock out all three. Yep. So these kids will have bizarre neurological um, or, or un unsteady gait um, they may be um, dysarthric, they may be ataxic, they may have a tremor. I mean, kids can also get tremor when they're about to vomit. They can also get tremor when they're vasovagal. They can get tremor when they're in a lot of pain. And they get tremor when they're really um, febrile. They can get, you know, tremor's really high. Did that answer your question? Sort of, sort of. Okay. Five-month-old boy. Eczema with starting solids, isn't that a classic? <laughs> Breastfed kid who starts solids. I mean, there are four classic dietary triggers for eczema in a child under six months of age. Dairy, wheat, soy, egg. Dairy, wheat, soy, egg. Dairy, wheat, soy, egg, that is it. So uh, having said that, a, a diet that for a breastfeeding mother that excludes dairy, wheat, soy and egg is a diet that will probably stop your breast milk supply. So sometimes those kids will, babies who've got you know, extensive eczema under six months of age may benefit from a trial of a hypoallergenic formula, whether that's um, Pepti Junior, Neocate. Alpha Mino tends to be better tolerated in terms of its taste, Alpha Mino formula. Um, and the rice-based, rice protein-based formula that's been put out by Novolac. I'm sorry, I probably shouldn't be saying any brand names here, I'm sorry. But Novolac are the only um, team in Australia who supply a rice protein-based, nutritionally complete infant formula that's available over the counter. So, um, and for any of the hypoallergenic formulas, uh, for breastfed babies in particular who may balk at the flavour of the hydrolyzed formulas, um, a, Cheat's trick is to add maple syrup or um, golden syrup, a little bit of um, something malted, um, sort of liquid sugar to the bottle for the first couple of bottles or a couple of drops of vanilla essence does the trick really nicely as well. 
Um, so sometimes the babies will need a bit of maple syrup or golden syrup stirred into each bottle. Just, you know, a third of a teaspoon. It doesn't have to be much, just enough to take the flavour. Has anybody ever tasted Nia Cave? You can tell if you walk around the Geelong Hospital Special Care Nursery, you can pick which baby's on Nia Cave by walking around and smelling the air. But they just smell bad. Okay, eczema with starting solids. Fully immunised, four days of spike in fevers, no symptoms of focus. The only thing the parents can pick is the neurofin, oh, so the ibuprofen, the paracetamol doesn't really touch the signs in terms of the fever. The fever doesn't seem to be responding to any of either of those, which as we've said before, doesn't actually help you in deciding whether it's viral or bacterial. But the child seems to be crying in misery. They get temporary relief of their pain really hard to assess pain in kids who are febrile and unwell. And the parents describe whenever they change the child's nappy today, so they've had two trips to a GP and then the third trip to the emergency department, and they've said whenever they change the child's nappy, um, the child screams and then looks very pale and vomits once the nappy's been changed. This child has osteomyelitis. Of, uh, some of the lumbar vertebrae. And by the time this was identified on first bone scan and then MRI, there were three vertebrae affected by the osteomyelitis. And this child's looking at six months of antibiotics, initially six weeks um, through a PIC line with a Baxter pump running flucloxacillin. This was a sensitive um, staph aureus that probably came from the child's eczema. So a skin, skin portal for a staph bacteremia that lodges in the spine. And the only symptoms this child had of focus was whenever you bend the child, whenever you uh, put the spine into flexion, you're putting pressure on that, on the abscess, pressure on the infected bone. This was incredibly hard to pick and it was like the focus of the infection. We picked that the kid was sick um, but we had two positive Staph aureus blood cultures and a normal echo of this child. The child had been on flu clocks and vank uh, from the moment they hit the emergency department for the third visit, but we didn't pick the focus until uh, the child had already been in the hospital for about four days. This was really hard. Okay, is that enough for fevers for now? Should we switch to fits and faints? Yep. 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 Ab absolutely. So the question, um, when do we swab a rash in a febrile child to try to determine whether it's bacterial or viral? Uh, it's, so yes, absolutely, swabs were done for this boy, but the swabs are going to take two days to come back. Um, it's, this was very much on um, clinical picture recognition of the rash and the lesions and the directions that they were cropping up and the idea that there were clusters of vesicular or pustular vesicular type lesions that were cropping up in different locations that then all became secondarily uh, crusted over um, desquamating bullous lesions and then you know, sudden deterioration, the child's vital signs. Uh, trying to capture herpes virus infected eczema really early, I wouldn't wait for a swap. If I have a child who has eczema and I think that they've got eczema herpeticum cold sore and then they've got eczema already, I'd start acyclovir early, trying to capture that first two or three days um, before it starts to spread. And then what I'll do on top of that is the once the child's much more comfortable or once you've got heaps of good analgesia, is do the bleach salt oil bath. Have you all seen the recipe from the Royal Children's for eczema care with salt and QV bath oil and bleach in the bath, bath water, and mupiracin over the top. So with bacterially infected eczema, really good topical treatment, even in a child who might be febrile, really good topical treatment um, with the bleach bars and liberal use of mupiracin, and I mean like five tubes of mupiracin a day, has been found to be superior to IV flucloxacillin. 
So uh, sometimes we'll certainly, um, we'll certainly get IV access in these kids. For FBE, CRP, we want to make sure that they've got normal white cells, make sure that their film looks good. Because if they've got an unexpected neutropenia of 0 0.3, then we know we're in trouble and we need to work that out later. Uh, and also blood cultures to find out how far the infection's gone. But we might not necessarily use that IV for flu clocks or VANC, even if they're admitted. We might just go really hard with the topical therapies if it's just bacterial. If it's viral and then bacterial, then you need to throw the book at them to give them everything. These kids are often in quite a lot of pain as well as being very tender to touch. Um, so they, um, like the Coxsackie kids where their mouth is just full of HSV, gingival stomatitis, um, they're at risk of getting quite dehydrated with pain if their um, oral mucosa is involved. Can you give us guidance the emergency? Because that would be quite expensive if they were going Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. And in hospital, I guess, in the emergency department, we just give them a shoebox full of it. Yep. You want to try to keep the skin that's infected moist. So staph and strep loves crust. It's both kinder to the kid to soak the crusts off and it means that your treatment's going to work much, much better. Thank you. Right. Collapsed kid. Uh, summer, summertime, January, school holidays. Kindergarten age girl, fully immunised, very active. And the parents described she's like her big brothers, this girl. She's trying to keep up with her big brothers. And I don't know whether that means she's just a normal four year old girl. And the parents were hoping that their four year old girl would be a placid craft, doing kind of sit at the kitchen table kind of girl. She was always in the backyard. Went to bed with her head cold, woke up a couple of times overnight feeling hot. One of the parents gave a dose of antipyretic, but they can't remember what time it was, what bottle they took down from the top of the fridge. It could have been Zyrtec. They can't actually remember what they gave the child. And they can't remember how many meals they gave the child either. They didn't write any of that down. Wakes at nine o'clock doesn't feel hungry, feels a bit hot, goes out to the garden with a dog. Everything goes quiet for a while and then the parent says, oh, she's feeling a bit better today. She's gone out to play, but she's left her shoes behind and takes a pair of shoes out to the four-year-old and finds her semi-conscious near the back steps, lying in the grass. She's got blood in the mouth. She's got a bruise on her forehead and an abrasion coming up. She looks confused and a bit dysarthric, um, so it doesn't seem to be making sense. Words sound mushy. Abrasion on her forehead's now trickling blood. The parents put an ice pack on it, put her in the back of the car and bring her to the GP clinic. What's our differential diagnosis here? Could be anything. Can we, can we get seven? Can we try to get seven? Febrile convulsion. Snake bite. Thank you. Hypoglycemia. So ketotic hypoglycemia in a preschool age kid with a viral infection. Hasn't eaten. Yes, encephalitis, meningitis. Yeah, she could have tripped and fallen over and whacked her head. Great. So if we start to shift away from febrile kids towards kids who are having funny turns, this starts getting really clinically challenging, trying to do a neurological assessment and assessing neurological symptoms in kids of different ages. Trying to diagnose syncope versus seizure is something that I'm trying to do all the time in clinical practice and it can be quite challenging. So I thought I'd give you a couple of slides worth on the, uh, my, my take on it. Unless you have an EEG attached at the time of the funny turn, everything else needs to come on clinic on history. Okay, So trying to get an eyewitness is really helpful. And um, kids who are in daycare when the funny turn happens, I will phone the daycare worker. I'll try to phone the daycare centre and try to get that worker on the phone and try to ask them detailed questions over the phone, try to get them to describe. So it's better, to be honest, if the eyewitness is in front of you because I try to get them to mimic to think through in their mind, sequence by sequence, what did they see the child doing and can they mimic it for me in front of me? So whether there's movements, whether there's stillness, do they lose posture? Do they start to lean and drool before the event? 
Do they maintain, maintain eye contact with people nearby? Do they make any sounds? So a child who is upright and looking well and then grunts, loses posture to the ground and goes completely flaccid and unconscious on the ground for 15 to 20 seconds. So that's a, a quite a typical type of seizure, but once kids start to do it over and over again, it starts to look like absence plus postural drop, but they tend to grunt before they do it. What happens immediately beforehand and what happens immediately after? So you get all of that. What are the habitual triggers for syncope in kids? It's pretty much the same as in adults, but you're seeing it from a kid's perspective. So anything that is painful or might be painful, and that's hard because kids are doing themselves minor injuries all the time, stubbing their toe, punching their brother, biting down on something and they accidentally bite down on their own tongue. Um, there's lots of different occasions that are painful that might trigger a syncope in a child that are hard to determine. Tasting something yucky, smelling something yucky, obviously the sight of blood or um, the sight of something sudden and confronting. So about once a year I'll have a kid who comes to see me who's had a syncope in a movie cinema <laughs> and usually they've been um, feeling a little wobbly, they see something that they're not happy with, they stand up to try to exit the cinema and then they pass out in the aisle at the cinema, which is hard because they're then in the dark and nobody can see what's happening and give you an eyewitness account. Passing faeces, coughing, vomiting, any postural change that raises the cerebral perfusion pressure, so they've got a stable blood pressure, stable intracranial pressure, but then they move, they do some kind of postural change. Um, if you want to giggle, there's a great YouTube string. Uh, there was a crew of um, American University students that proved that they could elicit a syncope, a good vasovagal syncope, and display what they do during a syncope by um, squatting down, hyperventilating for about 15 to 20 seconds, not very long, but to big, deep breathing hyperventilating, and then standing up, and they, will, they all go over <laughs> like, like cows. It's quite funny. A sudden embarrassment in a kid can sometimes cause a syncope and sometimes the parents won't realise that the child is hyperventilating in the setting of embarrassment and anxiety. It's a classic thing for young girls. Tantrums with breath holding. Kids can um, go alarming types of blue and purple when they're breath holding during or after a tantrum and sometimes can lose consciousness as part of that tantrum breath holding sequence. They can lose consciousness and have a short generalised tonic-clonic event during the loss of consciousness on the floor. The first thing I'd check is a ferritin. Even if the haemoglobin and the ferritin is normal in these kids, if they are breath holding to the point where they're having altered consciousness, even if their ferritin is normal, pushing their ferritin up closer to 100 will fix the breath holding attacks. They'll still be tantruming and they'll still be behaviourally difficult, but they won't be losing consciousness and they won't be holding their breath. <coughs> A parent telling you off or a teacher telling you off, getting your first attention, that's a good one for teenage girls to suddenly syncope in the corridor or out the front of the classroom. So what doesn't help you with determining whether an event was syncope versus seizure in kids? Tonic-clonic motor activity is very common during a syncope-related loss of consciousness and then you just need to figure out what the source of the syncope was. Whether they lose continence during the event doesn't help you. Whether they have bilateral eye de deviation, a lot of kids will have eyes that are partially open and eyes that are deviated either upwards or laterally during a simple syncope and a vasovagal faint rather than during a seizure. That doesn't help you. And how rapidly they return to normal alertness doesn't really help you. Some kids after a 30 second to 50 second generalised tonic-clonic seizure will be post-dictal for maybe two or three minutes and then they'll get up and look like they're looking fine, which would look to the rest of us like they've had a vasovagal faint, but they've actually had a seizure. They still won't be quite right. They're going to be intolerant of loud noises. They won't want anybody trying to help them. They're going to behave like they've got a really bad headache for a couple of hours, but they don't actually look post dictal in terms of classic drowsy, confused, reduced GCS. If the tongue has been bitten hard enough to bleed, that probably helps you say it was a seizure, unless you're a teenage girl. I've seen a couple of teenage girls who've had vasovagal syncope or psychogenic events, 
um, that they're happening repeatedly and they will run through the sequence. They'll um, start losing control of their bladder and they'll urinate or pass wind at the same time as the event or they may bite down and, and they're doing a really impressive generalised tonic clonic but it's all psychogenic. Um, eyes tightly closed throughout is very likely to be psychogenic but anything, any of these things that happen in water, it's not going to be psychogenic and it may, it's got a much higher risk of being cardiac in origin. So, is there anything that does help us? History from the patient can sometimes help you. The hard bit being that kids might not give a great history of how they felt right before the event. Anything that says they felt like their head was throbbing, they felt hot and cold and flushed, they felt a bit nauseated, they, they look like they were about to vomit, that's going to be a syncope. This doesn't happen in seizure. If they say their hearing felt muffled or they couldn't hear people, they could see people talking to them but they couldn't hear the, or couldn't understand what their teacher was saying, that's going to be a syncope, it's not going to be a seizure. If it's visual loss, that's probably going to be syncope. If it's visual gain, that's more likely to be seizure. Does that make sense? People who have zigzagging wavy lines, it's either a migraine or a seizure. Whereas if they get um, grey fading in from the edges, everything starts to go foggy and distanced and they lose ability to focus on the foreground, that's going to be a syncope. Not many four-year-olds who can give that kind of history. Anybody who said, any kid who says, I could tell it was about to happen, that's going to be a syncope. It's not going to be a seizure. Kids cannot tell that they're about to have a seizure unless they say, it happens every time I sit down on the couch with my iPad. <laughs> In which case it's going to be a photic stimulus. There's a particular game that they're playing on their iPad. There's a particular flashing lights. Who here has, we were talking about SATS monitors and glucometers and glucose gel in clinic. Who here has Fortnite at home or somebody at home who's playing Fortnite? Yeah, there you go. Fortnite is crack cocaine for children. Don't let it in the house. That's all I can say. I have not met a family who've been able to modulate or effectively restrict their child's use of the digital game Fortnite without actually trying to either ban it altogether or causing major disruption in the household. I don't know, just, it's crack cocaine, get it out of the house. Anyway. Okay, often what the paediatricians will rely on, if we get it, is mobile phone footage. This also actually helps with the differential diagnosis. Okay. If the events are happening frequently enough in a child to, for a parent to be there to capture mobile phone footage of it, it's probably not going to be a seizure unless it's actually full-blown epilepsy and it's happening all the time. So I've seen great videos of um, three and four-year-olds with absence um, and somebody will be videoing a kid and they'll come in and complain of gait attacks here, but actually what's happening is absence seizures. And I've had videos of... Um, There are some toddlers and babies about hmm, 10 to 18 months of age who will have bizarre habitual situations when they will have either a tremor or a strange movement, um, arms going out, looking up to the ceiling, and it's a developmental phenomena. And they are making beautiful eye contact with the parent immediately before and after. And if you hold a toy up and rattle a toy around the child, usually they're in a high chair or sitting on someone's lap, these, these events don't happen in sleep. Um, if you rattle a toy or hold the child up around the child, we'll have this sort of episode and we'll be obviously trying to lock eye contact on the toy. Um, so that's, a, that's another classic video that I've seen. Or psychogenic. Right, EEG does not help you, but everybody needs a 12 lead ECG, please. So two to 5% of healthy kids who have no background and no other risk factors for developing epilepsy will have an epileptiform abnormality if you do an EEG on them. This number gets even higher if somebody in the family tree has diagnosed epilepsy that's needed medication during um, adolescence or adulthood, or if the child has any background in developmental delay, autism, 
neurodevelopmental conditions. Sorry, is that too fast? Somebody was taking a photo. Is that too fast? Yeah. Is there a connection between um, migraines and seizures? Mm. No, not really. Not in kids. Migraines are actually quite rare in kids in terms of um, brain migraines. Abdominal migraines are more common. So cyclical vomiting, abdominal migraines. A child who has um, three to five days of profuse protracted vomiting without any fever, without any other symptoms, about every four to six weeks in a family where a couple of members of the family get migraines. That's going to be a cyclical vomiting picture in a child who's otherwise well, developing normally, not constipated. Um, yeah. Those kids need a liberal supply of ondansetron wafers. So you give them um, appropriate to how many kilograms they are, but you give them a couple of supplies of 10 and suggest that they keep two or three wafers in the car, two or three in mum's handbag, two or three in the daycare bag, two or three in the pram, as well as a couple at the kids' bedside table. Because if you can nip it in the bud, it does have a migraine component to it. Uh, so it's um, vasospasm, same as for adults or adolescent, cerebral migraine, but it's a vasospasm of the um, mesenteric blood supply. And the kids will vomit profusely and get quite dehydrated in cycles. And if you can nip it in the bud with ondansetron and rest, um, they end up only having two or three vomits instead of three days' worth of vomiting. So anybody who comes in, any child who comes in with a fit, faint or funny turn, what am I doing? 9.55. Yay. Always check a 12 litre ECG. This is a unique opportunity to prevent a sudden cardiac death in a young person. Almost always the 12 litre ECG is going to be normal. I don't really want lots of kids being sent off for EEGs, but I want all of kids with funny turns, fits, faints, syncope, not quite sure what it was. I want all of them to have a 12 litre documented. If you're not quite sure about what the 12 litre is telling you, send it to your local paediatrician and ask them to have a look. Always take a family history of cardiac and syncope events. Safety advice. So these kids aren't driving, but they're going to be climbing to a height where their feet are higher than their own head if they were standing at ground level. So I say none of that. So they can play in a playground, but I don't want that child climbing any higher than their own height until these episodes are sorted out and until these episodes are stopped. I don't want these kids out of arm's reach when they are in water at any point. Because if one of these episodes, even though we don't know, you need to get, with kids like this, you need to get good at saying, I don't know what it is. I'm not sure what it is, but we need to put all the safety things in place, regardless of what it is. Um, this is a unique opportunity to improve the child's safety. Bike riding, climbing to heights, where they're going for L, pa L plates. Um, I've seen a couple of teenage girls who've been referred with query syncope, query seizure-like events. And as soon as you articulate that they will not be able to start their L plates learning until they've had six to 12 months free with no events, that's a great way of switching off psychogenic events in teenage girls. <laughs> they really want to get their Ls. <laughs> they want independence from their parents. That's why they keep fainting. That's why they keep you know, fainting. All right. First aid advice, there's a couple of good A4 posters. Um, I always provide A4 um, first aid. So, I mean, there's lots of posters of different sizes, but the A4 ones can be photocopied by any childcare, any school. Uh, it just needs to run through the posture to put a child in the safe, safety position, left lateral position, if they're having an event of some type that's weird, and highlight, you know, that's what triple O is, is for. A lot of teachers or daycare workers may be quite hesitant to call triple O if it's a child who's got sudden abnormal loss of consciousness, sudden abnormal consciousness, their airways at risk, so call triple O. You know. If possible, can they try to video it, whatever is happening, can they try to video it, even if they don't capture the start, because your phone will show you elapsed seconds, and even if you end up putting the phone down and leaving the video and you're talking on the phone to triple O or you're helping the person, it continues elapsed seconds and it'll keep picking up the voice. So you'll be able to listen to the footage that they've got and see whether there's any um, classic neurology happening at the time of the event. Um, one of the paediatricians I had the privilege to work for, work with at the Royal Children's Hospital was a general paediatrician called Hugo Gold. And um, he, he, he was named Hugo Gold for a good reason. He just dispensed gold everywhere he taught, everywhere he practised in clinic. One of the wisest things that Hugo ever said to me was, as a general paediatrician, 
the hardest kids and the hardest cases, you try to stay in the boat with them and steer them through the fog. You don't need to necessarily take responsibility for everything that's happening on the boat. You don't need to try to pretend that the fog isn't there. Just stay with them in the boat until the fog starts to clear. Okay. So wouldn't it be great if all, kids, all parents had done a first aid course? There are some fantastic first aid courses out there and any child who's having any type of episode over and over again, including the febrile daycare kids who are driving their parents mad, it's very helpful if the parents can do a first aid course and they start to get an idea of how to handle different symptoms in childhood. Wouldn't it be great if every child who could be immunised was immunised? This is um, the front cover of my favourite Q&A booklet released by the Australian Academy of Science. Um, and if you log on to their website, they've got some great um, pamphlets about the medical effects of climate change as well, which is interesting. But um, I tend to give these, it's an A4 booklet. It's about seven or eight pages long. Most of the vaccine hesitancy families that I have coming through my rooms, the parents are avid readers and they will have read very widely. They've just gone down a rabbit warren of misinformation on the internet and they've got a deeply held belief that they are protecting their child by avoiding vaccines. Try to um, work with them and start an effective conversation to think about pre-contemplation, changing their mind to vaccinate their children. Uh, often I'll give them written information. I think this is the best that we've got. O2SATs, finger prick glucometer, and if you've got a glucometer, it's worth, worthwhile having the glucose gel uh, with you, because if you do a finger prick or a heel prick on a kid who's got an altered conscious state and you get a BSL of 1.2, you want to be able to act on it immediately, <laughs> even if they're not quite well enough to feed. So you can rub 2.5 mils of the glucose gel in the side of the child's mouth, and they'll start to, they'll get good enough oral mucosal absorption of the dextrose that you'll be able to bring their um, BSL up just enough to get the next sequence of hypoglycemia treatment into them. So that's it. Any questions? 10 o'clock. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.